Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the IP Group PLC Valuations Deep Dive presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. And these will be available via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to CFO David Baines. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. Hello. Um, yes, I'm David Baines. I'm the CFO actually, of IP Group. And I've got with me Chris Gaston, who's our finance director. Chris is with me. I'm, I'm going to host it. Chris is going to do most of the presenting. And that's because Chris and his team do most of the work. So that seems appropriate. Um, I, I hope you're going to enjoy This is our first of our deep dive webinars, where we're actually going to pick up one particular topic and look at it more closely. Uh, I did say to Chris when we first conceived that we do a deep dive uh, valuations um, a webinar, but it probably wouldn't be over attended. I said, look, Chris, you're going to get 10 or 20 people, but it's okay, it's going to be important 10 or 20 people, and uh, you know, it's an important subject. Well, as I speak, we've got 257 people registered watching this event, so thank you very much to all of you uh, for being there. Uh, I hope you find it as interesting as we do. So very quickly, uh, we're going to run you for a quick introduction, and then Chris is going to go on to market context. He's going to talk in detail about our valuation approach, how we value our assets, and then point out how valuations are disclosed and important accounts. Uh, and then finally, perhaps most importantly, look at our track record, how good we are at getting our values right. Because it's the litmus test is when you sell an asset, do you get it right? Do you hopefully get it for more than you've been carrying it in the books at? So we'll look at that at the end and see how well we've done on our track record. So very briefly, um, uh, as a start, um, this is one of the key things at the moment about IP Group. There is quite a, a, a divergence between our net assets and our share price. We've got net assets rent fully valued at £1.33 a share. I think this morning we're trading at about 55p. To put that another way, and as I pointed out at the year results, you've got about 15 pence of that, £1.33 is in cash. Well, that's obviously, you know, cash is cash. And then Nanopore at that time was about 20 pence, even after a slight reverse, it's still about 17 pence this morning. And then just a few of the three other companies we talked about in the year results, First Light, Espresso, Oxbodica, that gets you to over 60p of value. And yet we trade below that. The other 91 companies of 95 aren't included in that valuation at all. So clearly there's something going on around valuation, which is why we thought it was important to actually spend time looking at what we do to try and get valuations as right as we can. I'll come back to this slide at the end. So at the beginning, we'll sort of start. This is, this is our level of knowledge at the beginning of this webinar. We know 8% of what we have on our, on our NAV of £1.33 is cash. That you know it right. And 17% and is quoted portfolio companies. So again, you know that's why that doesn't mark the market, that's the price there on the market. So it's that pesky 75% that we're going to talk about today. So that's the slide to remember. At the end of this presentation, we'll come back to that slide and we'll, hopefully we'll all know and understand better what components make that up. So I think probably the last thing for me, now I don't want to look like I'm telling you what to think, but I'm going to tell you what our key lessons are and let's hope they come over in the course of today. So firstly, um, we think we have a very thorough process and we incorporate best practice in all the valuation work we do. We think the work we do is consistent and mildly cautious, as I've said, the auditors agree with us. The realised gains on disposals seem to provide evidence that our, we are cautious and that we are getting our valuation to right, not very slightly below what they might be. And finally, we believe we're very transparent and we give detailed disclosure of our valuation processes. So we'll let you judge. We'll come back to these points in, at the end of the presentation. For now, I'll hand over to Chris. We'll take it through the bulk of the presentation. Chris. Great. Thanks, David. Thanks for the introduction. As David said, I'm Chris Basson. I'm the finance director here. And great to have everyone attending. Um, me and the, the finance team spend a lot of our time valuing the portfolio. So it's great to have an opportunity to take you through what we do in, in more detail. So first section I was going to cover is market context for 2022. Uh, and this is partly to give you a sort of indication of how we think about the market when we're valuing our portfolio. So the, the next couple of slides contain pitch book data where we find pitch book uh, to be our best source of private valuation data. They've got a very extensive database of US and European valuations, private valuations. So this is US data from pitch book from their Q4 annual report. And at the very high level in the VC space, the two key themes, early stage valuations on the left, 
we see is higher in 2022, strong momentum from 21 and continuing um, in 2022 with valuations higher. Um, early stage pitch book defined as series B or earlier, which consists of about two out of our top 20 companies and then many of the earlier stage companies in our portfolio. And then on the right hand side, later stage valuation. So this is series C and onwards pitch book data sees those softening in 2022. So about 20% down in the year from 2021 levels and with much of that softening happening in the second half of the year. Uh, but it is worth noting that there is a, a large dispersion of experience within that data. So um, good companies can still raise at higher valuations. So drilling down to the next level of detail, um, it, cutting that data by our three thematic areas, we see the clean tech and life sciences data within PitchBooks data set as, as indicating strong performance in 2022. So valuations up year on year. Within our tech um, thematic area, more mixed picture. So FinTech, flat, enterprise tech down a little bit and consumer tech down somewhat more. We're saying that we've got very little direct exposure to consumer tech. Our exposure is more second sort of second degree by potential customers or acquirers. So we do think that across our three thematic areas, we're actually playing into areas of strength in the market for 2022. So just putting that in a bit more context for what that means for IP groups portfolio. So our portfolio of um, early stage and, and more mature companies are raising money uh, as they go along. So we typically expect about a third of our companies to raise money in a given year. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, actually 29 of our companies raise money in both years, um, in, in those years. And when we, we um, have financing transactions in the portfolio, we track whether those transactions have happened up, flat or down valuations versus the previous financing round that the company has executed. And we saw in 2022 that there was no increase in down rounds within the financings done within our portfolio. And in fact, uh, a slight increase in up rounds. So we didn't see any evidence from our portfolio of a softening of valuations. Uh, it's also worth noting that we, we manage around 700 million of uh, third party funds. We didn't see those trends in those third party funds that we manage either. And then just drilling one level down into, into the data within our portfolio, we also didn't see a softening in valuations in the second half of the year. So we weren't seeing that picture that I mentioned from the pitch book data. So that, that's some high level um, information on our market context. Moving on to the group's valuation approach. Um, so what do we mean when we're talking about valuation? So we're talking specifically about fair value for accounting purposes. And that's defined under international accounting standards and the practice guidelines for how to, how to carry those out in the private equity or uh, venture capital portfolio are contained within IPEV. So we follow those IPEV guidelines when we value our portfolio. And what we're doing when we're, we're assessing fair value, we're estimating fair value for our private portfolio. Uh, and we're trying to arrive at the best estimate possible, supported by as much evidence as we can. That's the sort of core thing that we're trying to do. So some high level valuation principles that um, really sort of form the core of our approach. Um, we have a thorough, well-documented process. We take a mildly cautious approach to valuations. We have a policy that we have applied consistently for, for many years, and that consistency we feel is very important. We make maximum use of market-based data. So we're always looking for market-based evidence, and we'll always use that evidence in preference to non-market-based evidence where it's available. We, we typically use multiple methods, uh, so we don't just take a price of recent investment, for example, we'll also look at revenue multiples or a DCF, so we'll try and get multiple ways of looking at the same asset and, and triangulate those approaches. Our investment team inputs extensively into the process, but they're not responsible for valuations. The finance team are responsible with, with oversight from um, the Audit and Risk Committee and Evaluation Committee, so we have segregation of duties, which we think is an important part of, part of best practice. We have multiple layers of challenge through the process, and then we have transparent disclosure of the resulting valuations. And just to give you some, some stats on the process from, from 2022, so this is both our annual reporting and our interim reporting for 2022, we carried out 301 internal valuations, which we documented. We had 18 external valuation reports commissioned. We made 63 private valuation adjustments outside to uh, normal funding rounds. So that's about 20% of our uh, valuations resulted in adjustments. We held four valuation committees four audit and risk committees focused on external disclosures and our auditors uh, included 93% of our portfolio value in their sample. So what we're really aiming for from those principles is conservative approach. So I've highlighted those areas where we feel help us to deliver that. And we're really looking to build best practice 
into our process and again i've highlighted those best practice elements which we feel are important so before i get into the detail of, of how we uh do our valuations just a, a handful of points on valuation capability and sort of what we feel really helps us to arrive at accurate valuations for our portfolio so sort of key um most important factors are the long-standing expertise of our team so that's the our investment team also the board and support teams many of whom have been involved for many years and, and working with the companies in our portfolio for many years so that consistency and that depth of knowledge is very very helpful the close relationships we've got with the majority of our portfolio companies also gives us insight and information that others might not have so we're the top shareholder in 10 out of our top 20 companies so that that close relationship over many years often often from inception is very important our, our wide portfolio and that's breadth by stage sector and geography as well as extensive history gives us a big data set to use so uh, we use that both sort of in in the year but also looking back over time and seeing where we've got things right or wrong or could improve things and then as a plc the governance and risk management processes that, that we have as a plc are very useful to bring independence into our process so i think that those are sort of the key elements of where we think we've got good valuation capability so um, diving more into our process um th now this is the same process uh, largely be it half year reporting or year end reporting with the main difference being the level of work performed by our external auditor but effectively from an internal point of view the same process so first step is a planning and risk assessment stage where we're looking at factors like the time since the last funding round positive or negative milestones for specific companies general market conditions and we use that first step to to identify assets that we want to spend more time on the more subjective assets and we also use that first step to select which companies we're going to give to our external valuers for them to take away and uh, perform valuations on independent of us. So the, the next step, which is really the sort of meat of the valuation process, this is information gathering, both gathering company specific information, such as board packs from the companies. And worth noting that we've got almost three quarters of our companies, large companies we have board seats on, discussion with our investment team to get their view on performance on the outlook for the company, financial modeling where appropriate, and then determining a valuation approach. And also worth noting that we do cross-check our valuations where other uh, public investors have investments and disclose them. We will cross-check our valuations to disclose public valuations. So after we've done that process, we've arrived at a set of initial valuations and then comes a review and challenge stage. So firstly, evaluation committee that comprises the CEO, CFO, and auditing risk committee chair. And that's where really the majority of the um, discussion and subjectivity is covered that valuation committee covers typically around 80% of the portfolio by valuing a quoted portfolio. Then there's an audit and risk committee consisting solely of independent directors. And we also have our external auditors who, uh, as I said earlier, uh, sampled 93% of our portfolio for the year end reporting. So finally, once we've gone through all that process, we're in a point to go ahead with our external reporting. So just a, a note on our use of external valuation specialists, which I, I referenced earlier. So we use those for larger and more subjective valuations typically. Kroll and Deloitte are the two valuation specialists we've used in 2022. They value 10 out of uh, our largest companies and those overall uh, contributed to 40% of, of the portfolio. And we feel like that's an important part of our process. It introduces independence. They have good market insights across a wide range of companies that they're working on. And they have specialist technical expertise. And in terms of the process, they do a similar process to where we were doing an, an internal valuation. They give us an output, which is typically a valuation range. And I've summarized the valuation range on the right for a section of the assets that they that they worked on. And you can see there's a top of the range at 577 million and bottom of the range at 392 million. So in all cases, we took no higher than the middle of the range given to us by our external valuation experts. And in some cases, we took lower or indeed the bottom of the range. So overall, that comes out at around a third of the way up the valuation range that we were given. And we actually think that that's a, a really good sort of indication for the mildly cautious approach that we think we take. That's a sort of good benchmark for how we would describe it. So going on to talk to the specifics of the valuation approaches that we take. Um, so I, I've um, listed them out here. These are in order of preference and they're ordered top to bottom and that's based on the degree of market input that there is in each of the approaches. So at the top quoted market prices, which is obviously the gold standard used wherever possible. And towards the bottom, more subjective approaches with less direct market input. And you can see on the right, we've just got a little uh, set of bars showing the proportion of the NAV used by each approach. So the top three are 
um, the predominant ones by far. So we've got quoted prices at the top and then recent financing transactions where we've used a, a recent financing price without adjustment. Next down would be a recent financing price that we've adjusted upwards or downwards based on positive or negative performance. We then have future market or commercial events which haven't completed at the time of the valuation where we've got um, clear documented terms showing us that the, a change of value looks likely to happen, likely but not certain at the valuation date. And then we have uh, discounted cash flow models and revenue multiples which um, contain less market inputs. So those are the, the broad um, approaches that we use. And then a few additional comments on our thinking for each of those approaches. On recent financing transactions, um, key questions that we're asking ourselves there are, um, first of all, is the financing transaction at arm's length? Does it include third, third party investors? And that's going to tell us whether we're even going to use it at all. If it's a purely internal round, we may say, actually, we don't think that represents fair value. Assuming we are going to use it, then we're thinking about what's the length of time since the financing round? Is the company's performance significantly positive or negative? Um, and we typically think of recent financing transactions as being strong evidence for the majority of the private portfolio where they've had recent financing rounds. And we have an early stage portfolio, portfolio that includes early stage companies. So they are raising money on a regular basis and we do receive regular inputs from financing rounds. Uh, and just one minor point to note is that sometimes preference structures can complicate the application of recent financing rounds. And that's particularly the case where a company is raising money with preference terms, which mean that those preference shares they're issuing uh, have additional rights versus the ordinary shares, for example, that we might hold. We do have a methodology for dealing with that, which typically means applying a discount between the issued share class with preferences and the subordinate share classes without preferences. So those are some thoughts on uh, recent financing rounds. Adjusted financing, sort of many of the same questions, uh, many of the same considerations. So really, this is um, where we've had a recent financing transaction that we have determined the performance is negative or positive enough for us to adjust the transaction. Uh, so we're then looking for what metrics can we use to help us quantify that adjustment. It's worth saying that um, particularly for internal valuations, we're quite reluctant to use this approach to increase the value of companies. So typically we'll use this to assess that a company's underperforming and we should therefore reduce the value where we see um, ourselves taking uplifts on adjusted financing, that's typically where we use third party valuation specialists. So you can see on the assets on the right, uh, First Light Fusion, we increased the value on this basis, but we used an external valuation. Actually, we used external valuations for all of the three companies highlighted on the right there. So, so moving to the less uh, frequently used approaches. So I mentioned briefly earlier future events. So this is where we have a transaction that is taking place. Uh, around the valuation date, but hasn't completed at the valuation date. And typically we're looking for documented deal terms. Um, otherwise we wouldn't typically incorporate it into our valuation basis, but where we have an event that appears to be happening and it's documented, we're then thinking, what's the nature of the event? Is it a sale? Uh, is it a commercial deal? How certain is it? How likely is it the deal parameters will change? How good is the evidence that we've got? And we'll factor all those in. And we will typically be quite uh, conservative in the approach because there is a risk that we overvalue the asset if that deal does fall away. And the biggest example of this uh, was in 2020 where we had a financing transaction which Oxford Down Hall was part way through completing when we released our results and we did incorporate the valuation uplift in that and, and that was the, the, um, the correct number that was completed shortly after we released our results. So then just briefly on the couple of other approaches that we, we use less frequently, discounted cash flows. So we, we typically only use this for therapeutic companies because they have a well-defined path through clinical trials. They have a set of um, probabilities that are relatively uh, uh, accessible market benchmarks on clinical trial success rates. There's often uh, also market data around deal values. So we feel more comfortable on therapeutic assets. Uh, outside that, that sort of specific example, we tend to find things like the cash flow forecast very difficult to get comfortable over and probabilities are equally very difficult to um, quantify or get comfort over. So therapeutic assets would typically be um, where we'd use this approach, but only if we haven't got a recent financing transaction. So Estesso is the, the, value, uh, is the example on the right there. And we did have an external valuation uh, as part of substantiating that approach. And then finally, there's a small number of companies in the portfolio which are in full commercial rollouts where we haven't got a suitable recent financing. So we will use revenue multiples for those companies. So then uh, one approach that I didn't mention earlier, but um, is also in the analysis that we give of our portfolio is a statement from LP. So we do have some 
holdings which are not held directly but via fund managers who manage those those funds for us the biggest example being ipg cayman lp the group's us platform and so in that case the fund manager goes through their own process which will look similar to ours to value their assets and they then give us the output of that uh, we receive those they're typically audited they're typically audited in arrears of the publication of our group results as a, as a listed company would publish earlier than those their valuation process uh, will be thorough but we'll also review the process and review the outputs where necessary where we deem it necessary we will source independent valuation advice on any of the larger uh, assets that we, we feel that's appropriate for and we will adjust the valuations given to us by the LP downwards if necessary so that, that's the, the, the sort of detail the meat of the valuation approaches that, that we use I thought it was helpful to highlight a, a handful of practical applications of um, that information from 2022 so we talked earlier about the later stage um, market data indicating reductions in, in later stage valuations. So we incorporated that into our valuation process by looking at some of the more mature companies, engaging external valuation specialists and taking some focus right down to between 25 and 40% for some of those companies. So we reflected um, that market data. First Light Fusion is a good example of an adjusted funding round where they had a very significant milestone of a validated fusion result. Again, we engage external valuation specialists, and that resulted in initial doubling of the carrying value, and that's, that was below the midpoint of the valuation range given by our external consultants. And then finally, Oxbotica, uh, uh, December financing, so a very recent financing, the only subjectivity in there was an assessment of the discount between the issued share, share class and the subordinate share class, where we took a small discount between the issued share class and the subordinate shares that we held, and then updated the valuation. So hopefully that gives you a feel for how we're approaching uh, that valuation process. So uh, I thought it was helpful just to highlight uh, a handful of our valuation disclosures, which give you more um, detail and transparency on some of the points that we just talked through. So uh, top 20 data, some data around portfolio company fundraisers, which we disclose, portfolio valuation basis and external valuation ranges. And many of these are additional disclosures that uh, are outside the core disclosures that we'd be required to give that we do feel are helpful from the point of view of transparency. Um, so on top 20 companies, we disclose the uh, that information in two places. We disclose that in the portfolio review section of our accounts, uh, and that's the, the top table on the right-hand side over here. Uh, we, uh, we disclose the investment movements, the percentage holding, um, and the closing value in any in investment or divestment from a company. In the back half of the accounts, note 13, we also include um, the list of companies, the valuation basis, and whether they've had an external valuation or not. Around market data, we include uh, data on the total capital raised within the portfolio, which is in the portfolio review section of our accounts. And that gives you a sense for how much of the capital being raised by our portfolio IP group has contributed, so about 10% for 2022. So it gives you an idea for uh, the degree of third party funding going into our portfolio and what that means from a recent financing point of view. We also disclose the up flat down round analysis that I had on the market context slide, and that's in the financial review section, which hopefully gives you a feeling for the market dynamics that we're seeing in our portfolio. We disclose the portfolio valuation basis against those categories that I've just been through. So that's both in the financial review section of the accounts and also in note 13 of the accounts, but we include some disclosures around valuation inputs. And then we also include valuation ranges. These are slightly buried at the back of the account. So these are in note 13. So we include ranges on two of our we included ranges on two of our largest assets, and then the overall range for the remainder of our assets. So that corresponds to the external valuation range slide that I showed earlier. So a lot of transparent disclosure in there, um, and a lot of additional information, which will hopefully help you to um, come to the same conclusion that our, our process is thorough and our conclusions are sensible. So then, very briefly on our valuation track record. The key piece of evidence that we're looking for, which we think provides strong evidence of our conservative valuation approach, is realized gains on exits. So over the last four years, uh, IP groups realized over 500 million in cash. And what we're looking for is on exit, we want to be seeing um, realizations for, from the exit at or above the last carrying value of the, of the company. And where that happens, we generate a realized gain on disposal. And as you can see from this first slide, over the last four years, we've generated realized gains in each year. So that indicates that we're uh, realizing our assets for more than their carrying value. In terms of how much more, I've highlighted some of the key exits from the last four years, and I've shown here the carrying value, the profit on disposal, and the premium on disposal. So how much above the carrying value 
did we sell our assets at? at? So you can see uh, that range of experience, and, and that works out as an average premium of seventy six percent across those companies that are highlighted, which is a, you know it's a significant premium. We do think that provides pretty good evidence of the conservative valuation approach, and we do feed that back into our valuation process through a process called back testing, where we're val validating and um, incorporating this exit data into our approach. So I'm going to hand back now to David for some concluding remarks uh, before we move on to Q&A. Brilliant, Chris. thanks so much. It's amazing yeah, for all that material in just 20 minutes. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so when I was asked if, and this is where we were, we were looking at, you know, you could see that net cash was 8% and quoted at 17%. We were trying to understand what the rest of the portfolio valuations are made up of. Hopefully now, with Chris having explained, this will make sense. So about 30% of recent financings that we talked about, we've got pretty high levels of certainty of the value of good of that. There's 22% you've got adjusted financing, that's where you based upon a prior valuation, but then you've made some adjustment of, of, um, of um, often in conjunction with the third party valuation. So, you know, you're, you're actually know for sure it gives you the confidence to make a change, but you've got that kind of third party valuation on, on your side. And then the, the smaller, perhaps slightly more esoteric approaches are up here. This kind of cash flow is only 7%, and revenue muscle is only 8%, as Chris said, and 3 and 7% for, for statements from LPs in the market. Uh, potential. So you can now hopefully, when we, when we go through that, that now makes sense what it is we've done. You get a very strong feeling of how it is that uh, we have really very good evidence for an awful lot of the valuations we actually have in, a, in our portfolio. In fact, when you take the, the cash and the public and the recent fundings and the ones valued by third parties, over 80% of the portfolio is valued by those metrics, pretty much outside of our control in most cases. So at the risk of being slightly dull, hopefully we've made our point. You know, we do have a thorough process incorporating best practice. We do believe we're, we're mildly cautious. The auditors seem to agree with us on that point. Um, Realised gains do seem to support the values you can carry things at. And if you have the entity to go for 205 pages of uh, uh, PLC accounts, we do have pretty detailed disclosure as well. So what I'm going to do now is go for some Q&As with Chris. Um, for those of you who are here when we did the year-end results, it was at this point when I checked over the, the questions and found instead of having two or three, I had 42, which was slightly daunting. But actually, especially as we made a commitment, we're going to answer every single question. Actually, this time, uh, I've been watching, watching as we go. And I'm glad to report they're very good questions, all of them. Uh, and there aren't too many. So hopefully, we'll be able to go through them together, between me and Chris. So I found that Chris will probably be answering them together. So, Chris, the first one uh, from uh, uh, Bruce. Bruce has asked, and this is related to the very early slides when you were talking about the performance of, uh, of public market information. FinTech has seen some very high profile down markets, yet China strikes something to down 80 90%. Are you saying that those are not representative of FinTech as a whole, or are you saying they're not representative of your own portfolio? That's a, it's a really good question. It, it is worth saying we don't have significant fintech exposure. We have uh, at least one fintech holding, um, but we're, we're not sort of heavily into fintech. So um, I'm you know, by no means an expert on the fintech space. I would say those um, those high, high profile rounds, they will be captured within the um, data that, that PitchBook produced. So they will be factored into that. And that, that does, as you suggest, indicate that there have been other financing transactions that have happened at higher valuations because we're not seeing an overall decrease in fintech um, valuations. I mean, I do think it is really interesting to sort of look at individual companies and clearly there are company specific dynamics like did they have to raise at a particularly bad time? And you'd say perhaps that's, that that's the case for at least one of the companies on, on the list there. Obviously, we don't know the detail of that. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's um, one of the really difficult things that we have to do is trying to reconcile company specific information with a broader picture for the market. And part of the way we try and do that is to track the data in our portfolio, which is partly that flat down round analysis. Um, I, I, think, I think you also have that bit. The fact has also been, for us, for certain army, we never had those very, very high increases. We, did, we, they, we didn't have an awful lot of companies in our portfolio if you go back to the one, which have been valued kind of West Coast American multi billion valuations. So we never took them up a lot in the first place. So we didn't have a lot to bring down on those levers. Some of those remarkable adjustments from 47 billion to five and stuff. We didn't kind of have much that in our portfolio, because I think it was a fact as well. Yeah, yeah. Quite a lot of stuff as early as then. Yeah. And it is worth saying that the, the largest fintech company in our portfolio, we, we did write down in 2022. So, um, so you know, that, that picture on the market is important. We've also had external valuation um, support on, on the carrying value of that asset, and we did take a write down. So yeah, uh, I think right. at least to some extent, we are uh, sort of doing as, as you suggest. And I agree. Yeah. Some we took about 27% in that one, despite yeah. actually, I won't name it, because we, we try and avoid naming individual companies. 
but actually had an amazing performance in the period, didn't it? Um, second question, and another very good one. It comes from Ken. Ken and I suspect it's Ken Rump. Hello, Ken, good to see you. Thanks for being here. For listed companies, do you apply a discount for liquidity size of stake versus market bid, which would be perhaps a smaller block? I think you used to do that. ONT would be an obvious example. So are we carrying it at full price? Are we allowing for the cost of sale? Yes. Okay, so that, that's a straightforward one. We don't apply a discount. And um, the reason we don't is we're specifically prohibited from doing that under, under IPEB guidelines. So uh, no, no, we don't do that. Uh, good answer. I can't add to that. Um, how many, we can probably both answer this, how many investment opportunities do you look at in a year? And how many actually pass the evaluation metrics? Where typically do they fail to meet your standards? Well, we, I'll start showing that one, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, right. We do see a lot. So um, we're looking at both a different number. Uh, you know, historically, if you go back, when we used to be um, looking at very, very early stage, only you really probably investing in one and a hundred things. And those sort of numbers may not change that much, actually. Uh, you see an awful lot of information uh, opportunities come in, a lot come in the people desks. It's a very small number that we do. And as in the keeping with our kind of um, overall strategy, the ones we're doing in our key the thematic areas that we're very focused on, ones that are very disruptive, have the potential to make a big impact on the world. So we want highly impactful stocks. Yeah, we want things that are ESG positive, ESG plus, we want it. We want to make sure we have a very positive impact on the world through what we do in our main areas. So they're the main criteria. It's a big market, very disruptive, good force for, uh, a force for positive good. Yeah, I suppose the one thing I'd add is that um, we are talking here prim primarily about valuation for fair value for accounting purposes, uh, whereas the investment team are going to be thinking more about value creation over a longer term and um, maybe less focused on the sort of mark to market twice a year exercise. We definitely do feed in as a finance team um, on specific investment um, opportunities and discuss the, the valuation with the, with the investment team where particularly where they want our input on it. Um, but I, I would say there's probably two slightly different things going on there around long-term value creation, which is what our investment team are focused on uh, and shorter term accounting and, and mark to market valuation, which is primarily what we're talking about here. Uh, good, good technical one coming up from Julian. Uh, what discount rates do you use in your discounted cash flows and have they changed over the year? So um, we, have, we, we have put our discount, so we're saying we don't use um, DCS that, that extensively, as, as you'll have seen from the slides. We did increase the discount rate that we used in the asset that we value on a DCF. Um, the, we, we don't disclose the interest rates that we um, use, and we use a combination of discount rates and probability adjustments. And the probability adjustment that's designed to capture things like the uh, chances of an asset getting through the next stage of their clinical trials, uh, that should, should, I think, be combined with the discount rate that we use. And that would get you to a sort of high 20, 25 percent on a both probability and discount rate basis. Yeah, I won't add to that. Uh, next one: How do you generally find management valuations vary uh, to yours? Is there a management expectation rate uh, regarding value against the ones that we put in? We go first on that, Chris. I might add to that. Yes, I suppose um, there's definitely. Uh, we, we tend not to discuss valuations extensively with the management teams of the companies that we're valuing, um, and we feel that that's, that, that's appropriate. We, we will sometimes, but um, it's, it's fairly rare. Um, I, I guess management teams are typically thinking more about fundraise dynamics, mm. uh, and particularly where a valuation has, uh, where a funding round has happened with a specific price, um, that's often a, a big factor on their thinking. Um, Sort of our, our, our trickiest job sometimes is to assess where we're moving away from that recent funding price, be that positive or negative, and quantifying how much lower or how much higher. And that's probably where we can have friction with management teams where they don't necessarily see eye to eye with us. So, so we're, we're looking for input from both, uh, predominantly from the investment team, sometimes from the company, although more rarely. Uh, but we are forming an independent uh, valuation conclusion based on, on our assessment. Yeah, no, well, but we're not, we're not going back for approval, are we? So it's, it's not such a factor. And an, an enormous number, as you say, are either marked to market or on recent funding value. So we have a completely aligned expectation. Yeah. We value it at what they managed to get it valued at quite, quite regularly, to be honest. Um, uh, Milos, question from Edison. Nice to have you here. Um, in the case, and I, I think we've got to answer this, in the case of assets valued using the future event method, do you include any discount? or execution risk. Yes, yes, definitely. No, that's an important part of it. So we would include quite quite big 
uh, execution risk discounts normally. It depends a lot on the nature of the event, how likely it is to go ahead, uh, how likely is the deal terms will change. So particularly on exits where um, those are often quite binary, we will apply quite quite heavy discounts. Yeah, and um, um, these questions come up all the time, which is fair enough, we'll answer them, we say we'll answer all questions, not directly linked to the valuation deep dive today, but um, uh, why do you not embrace a share buyback program given the mispriced of assets in public markets? We answer this a number of times, you know, year results of last month, um, and actually, you know, we do have a, a dividend policy, as we talked about, to give money back to shareholders, and we do have a, a policy towards uh, returning a certain proportion of our exits. So at the moment, we're on an enormous amount of exits in this current market, um, but we do still have that policy, and we'll follow it. Um, similar question, what steps the management take to increase the value of the group from the historic lows of today? Well, you know, we are, we believe, doing a lot. We've been very proactive in terms of our, our public uh, facing activities such as this. Uh, uh, we are uh, still got the share buyback, as we talked about. Um, we're, we're talking to our shareholders regularly. And actually, perhaps most importantly, we're driving up, hopefully, the value of our online portfolio. We believe there's a lot of very key inflection points in our portfolio in the next 12 to 18 months. Now, particularly with eight clinical trials out there that are having read out. So, so we believe that all those things will hopefully start to reduce that gap, much of which is actually driven just by macroeconomic forces, which are hard for us to manage. We are doing everything we can to try and reduce that gap and are very aware of it. Um, this is definitely one for you, Chris. Is the average gain of 76% over valuation a value-weighted average or a crude unweighted average? That's on the that's a value weighted average. So it's actually the, the, the sum of the realized gains over the sum of the carrying value um, for those specific assets. So it, it is effectively a, a weighted average. Uh, next one from Steve. Not valuation related, but how involved are you in the companies that you're invested in? Are board seats taken? Uh, answer yes, we're very involved. I, don't know. Uh, I think there were some stats earlier in the presentation right there, but we were very involved in all our bigger assets on the board. Of. We definitely have a very hands on model. So we are you know, in that business of helping companies grow very much, you know, business building alongside the company. So um, yes, in many all our private assets are directly involved. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a really um, helpful um, additional element that we, that we have in our valuation process. So a, a, a sort of that historic perspective on many of the companies we've been involved in for years, being on the board, sit, uh, getting the board material. So, so that information flow, that insight is, is really helpful for valuing these assets. So uh, yeah, it's an important part of our, of our model, I'd say. So next one from Odysseus, hello Odysseus at Berenberg. Good to see you so yesterday at a conference. Um, any chance, this might catch us out, any chance you have data on figures on the average fair value gains on fund demand that took place following internal valuation? If I take it, not talking about exit, we've already talked about it at length. I think historically these have been quite notable and prove your mildly cautious point more. Like that one, Chris. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I, I guess this is sort of, sort of quantifying the point on up, down, flat rounds. We don't have readily um, sort of presentable data on that, but it, it's a it's a good point. Um, you know, it is it is very company specific. So, um, we, you know, we've certainly seen plenty of examples of companies raising money at, at significantly higher valuations, uh, and we haven't seen lots of instances of down rounds. So, you know, I, I think your general point is right. is correct and it would sort of quantify the, the, the point on that. Um, I would argue to some extent, fair value gains of over 100 million in the private portfolio demonstrates that those ones do and they realise, they actually realise uh, fundraising, etc. They, they yeah, learn value yeah, 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 that's By right. definition, that's what that is saying, isn't it? Yeah, of, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, I suppose the only, the only sort of counter, counter argument to that is you'd expect companies that are going well to increase in value over time. And so, they, you know, they probably should be going up over time. In terms of unrealized gains, um, but yeah, I think it's definitely a good, good question, good point. Fair yeah, point. Um, um, Ed, to what extent is the pace of cash burn factored into your valuation methodology? So de definitely factored in. Um, yeah, how much cash a company's got, what their cash runway is, and particularly so, particularly when we talked about adjusted funding rounds and adjusting those downwards. Uh, where that starts to get quite kind of heavy-handed, so we will take quite big write downs is when that cash runway starts getting short, unless they've got you know pretty well um, developed plans to raise money. So yeah, that that is where we tend to get quite um, quite quite um, appropriately conservative, um, and and certainly it's a it's a factor when a company doesn't need to raise money. Um, it's harder harder to factor in, but the fact that they're not going to be in the market that they have that stronger position, I think, is a is a factor. 
Uh, and, and you know, we do tend to get inklings when companies are out raising money around what um, either their target valuation or for their level of interest. So, um, so it's definitely an important part of, um, of of the overall picture. And sort of going yeah, going back a little bit to the original question of um, some of those fintech companies, if you're out in a weak market raising money, you might have to take a much lower valuation. So uh, that you know, is an important factor. Uh, next one, uh, we both got answers. This is Paul. Good to have you, Paul. Newness. How well financed are the top 20 companies? Will they need to raise money in 2023? Want to go first, Chris? I'll come in there. Yes, yes. So, so we, we track the uh, cash runway of, of the majority of our portfolio, including the top 20 companies. Uh, and there's a, there's a sort of good handful of companies in the top 20 that we don't expect to have to raise again. And for the companies that we do uh, expect to raise again, the sort of average runways is getting towards the, the back end of 2024. So there's obviously some variation within that and some companies that we do expect to raise money in 2023, but that, that's the average position. So I mean, it's a pretty well financed. It's a difficult question. We had this question, not on the road chains, actually. It's quite difficult to answer in one word when you've got 95 companies. You know, I don't answer that one, like, we've tried. That weighted average one was quite good. The yeah. calculation of weighted, weighted average, average for the top 20. Came out at the back of, back of the next year. I had a look at doing weighted average. I looked at the top 35 companies, it's about a billion, just over a billion of assets, and 15% of those didn't need to raise money because they're break even or or weren't going to need to, about 30% were within a year, and then another 30% were two years, and then there's another 20% odd that actually went out until 25. So it's quite well spread out, but that just shows the similar of that, I would say. Um, uh, so thanks, that, Paul. There's other, uh, thank you, you're back, another question. We're doing well, all analyst questions so far. <laughs> um, do you think you can achieve higher uplifts on exits when selling to trade buyers compared to exits for financial investors? Hmm. Chris, go first, I'll go second, perhaps. Or would you like to take it from? Yeah, I'll start, I'll start with this one. Yeah, okay, it, it, it's an interesting question. I think maybe some of it depends on market. I think particularly therapeutic, both therapeutic. So, you know, as you mentioned before, yeah, historically, we probably had one clinical trial like that to read out every two years. We're at a key moment in our view. We've got eight clinical trials reading out in the next two years. I would have thought a lot of those ultimately would go into trade, you know, because obviously Big Pharma, Big Pharma's going to pay much more money because they know the value of what they get. And they also know the value they're going to add. They, they, they can take a drug that we're going to drug off the distribute while our portfolio companies go to drug off. And they'll have a worldwide marketing uh, infrastructure to distribute it. So they know they can take something, pay a lot for it, and it's still going to be worth an awful lot more money for them. So I think there are particular areas where, yeah, I think trade buyers are, are, are better. To, um, and, and that, to some extent, and then in the other portfolios, it'll, it'll be a, a mismatch. But a lot of time, I do think. Trade is the way to go because they'll understand the real disruptive nature quite often of what we've got. If you imagine our clean tech portfolio, people will understand that TK portfolio, kind of the value of what, we, what we've got there, uh, probably better than initial financial uh, investors would. Um, right, another one. This is Robert. Could you help us think about some of the factors that might contribute to a discount to that? For example, present value of future central office portfolio management charges. I'll say that again, I didn't read it very well. Could you help us think about some of the factors that might contribute to a discount on that? That's probably the question. For example, present value of future costs, I guess is what it's saying. So deducting those from the NAV. Yeah. I mean, that, that is obviously, um, in, in theory, our assets are fair valued at the year end. So, so the, the balance sheet value is, um, is what it is. But I do see that if you were doing a DCF, you, you would bring in the um, discounted value of, of costs. On the other hand, uh, if our portfolio continues to grow as we, we hope it will, you've got the, the, the value growth from the portfolio to offset that. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely one way of looking at it. It, it may well be a valid way, um, but in, in, in theory, the, the portfolio is fair valued at, at um, the end of the financial year. So, um, you know, if you're looking at it from a value point of view, it sort of is what it is. Okay, I think we've got that right, Robert. It's not come back to us. I think we, we, we've got that right. Uh, Paul Paul's back. Uh, uh, does Kiko see an increasing mix of investors coming to the early stage clean tech company? Well, I think the answer that they, they will do. Kiko, a very highly regarded team in the market, right? they're very well networked. And I think uh, the recognition of Kiko as kind of a separate brand uh, is certainly helping. And I think uh, they're putting an enormous amount of energy into coming you know, even more well networked in that marketplace. So I think the answer to that is yes, definitely. You'll definitely see a great diversity. Of, of high, uh, high profile investors coming into that space. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, they, they certainly, you know, they do report that it's it's a competitive space. There's obviously a lot of interest in, in clean tech. We think we're, we're well positioned there, but, um, you know, it's, it's a competitive space. So important to have that market position that, that we do. Uh, I'd just like to say, we're at 9.45 now, which I think is what we'd scheduled this for. Quick.
quite understand if some people want to drop off. Now, he said this before, but we've made a commitment that for those that want questions, we will keep answering our questions until we get to the end. Um, having confidently said there weren't very many, they seem to be growing as we go. I've uh, still got a few more to go, so I do quite understand people may need to go for their lives, but we'll carry on through and try and answer all the questions as well as we can do on the spot, which is ironic because the first one we may not answer because it's company specific. You'll probably avoid, I'll leave it out though, uh, from Paul. What risk adjustment do you use on a Stesso discounted cash flow? Um, and what are your rough peak savings? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it might be a little bit unfair, isn't it, Paul? Um, but, it, but it's worth it's worth sort of saying that um, Paul certainly writes in terms of how how we're approaching that DCF. So we have you know um, a drug in clinical trials. We have an estimate of the success rate of it going through clinical trials. We have an estimate of market value and, and partnering value. So that's sort of how our DCF works. Um, but I don't think we'll go into the specifics of um, the one. assumptions in this one. You happen to be an analyst, so maybe within the four walls of an analyst conversation, might give you some indication, but probably not fair to put it to public domain. Uh, Ed, you're back, thank you very much. Uh, good question. How often do peers carry valuations above yours? Chris, I think you. I, I would say, I mean, we would certainly like to be in the um, kind of sl slightly below our peers, consistent or slightly below. And we had at least one example I can think of clearly, which we discussed in our, in our valuation committee. Where we looked at peer valuations and we were at the lower end uh, below the two comparative valuations that, that we saw being disclosed out there so um, yeah we, we, we typically wouldn't want to be significantly above our peers um odysseus uh, hello good to have you back no, good try though good try you're trying exactly <laughs> the same question that paul tried i'll read it out but i think you're going to get the same answer could you go on a bit more on detail on your assumptions behind espresso valuation addressable market Assuming commercialization, probability of success of phase two B, etc. I think we won't put those in the, in the public domain. I will say, I still think most of them are pretty crude, but I have to say, particularly assumption of sales after the end of the patent date. But we won't put those in the public domain, but perhaps with a, the confines of an analyst daily meeting might give you some indication. Um, here's an interesting question I haven't actually seen before. Uh, David R., thank you very much for this. Do you factor in any environmental, social costs, benefits? Of portfolio businesses in their valuations, or if not, through separate measurement and reporting of their impact on people and planet. Shall we again? Do you factor in any environmental or social cost benefits of portfolio companies in their valuations? If not, so I, I, I don't think we specifically do. I mean, clearly, if something's got enormous ESG positive impact, it's likely to be more valuable. So one degree off, yes, we do. There's not a specific criteria on that. Um, so, but interesting. Your point about are we measuring reporting their impact on people and planet? Yes, we are. So remember, we're very impact uh, focused business. So we really are only interested in companies that we consider to be impactful and have a positive impact upon the world uh, going forwards. And we've employed a, a new full time uh, ESG director who's working on improving our reporting in this area. And one of the things we're doing is actually incorporated it into our uh, benefits and incentives is identifying key impact targets for our top 20 companies and then agreeing reporting with them and factoring those into our performance in the year. So this is an area we put an awful lot of thought into. What was there put an awful lot of thought into? How on earth do you report impact? It's a very difficult thing. You can report turnover in one number, not loss in one number. How do you report impact? And we are going to do an awful lot more work over it next year, trying to come up with some metrics that we can help people with on reporting impact. Not quite the answer to your question, but so it's not specifically factored into valuation companies, but generally any investment companies that have got significant impact. Uh, and uh, last one, <laughs> and <we'll, laughs> a comment from Paul saying, thought it was worth a try. <laughs> Why are we being so open on board of valuations? Um, that does look like, and not that far over actually, uh, 50 minutes in, it does David, look like we're there. David. To the end. David, Chris, absolutely. And thank you very much indeed for being so generous of your time there and addressing all of those questions um, that came in from investors today. And of course, if there are any further questions that do come through, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended for you to review. Um, to then add any additional responses, of course, where it's appropriate to do so, and we'll publish all those responses out on the Investor Meet Company platform. Um, but David, just really before redirecting those on the call to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, if I could please just ask you for a few closing comments Comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Hey, really, mate, the only last comment I was going to say, hopefully, we're going to do a lot more of these events as we said during this presentation. We're looking to you know, do uh, more communication with the markets in general and the shareholders. You can see here our upcoming events, quite an array of about 10 events we're doing this year. So, we are having a flagship event. All the ones with asterisks against them, we're going to include on this platform. 
So any of you on Vespa Meet will get invited and will be able to attend. And my next or big event is certainly going to be the AGM, an investor update where we're hoping that uh, Nanopore will probably be coming and speaking as well. So uh, a big event. Invites will go at that soon. But you will see further invites for some a further deep deep dive events, probably deep tech, clean tech, any life arts will be some more deep dive uh, specific events. So thank you very much, such a great attendance numbers. Um, and hope you all have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. David. Chris, that's great. And thank you once again for taking the time to update investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected and for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This won't take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of IP Group PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good morning to you all.